Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom and pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B to be business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. Charles Liu was raised and educated in Scotland, then made, made his way to Los Angeles, where he is now a boutique attorney for the top restaurants and brands. He's also a restaurateur, LA City's small business commissioner, and will be teaching a class at Loyola Law School this summer on Web3 and the Metaverse. Hey, Charles, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, Chad. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. Hey, uh, so what brought you uh, from Scotland to Los Angeles? Scotland to Florida for high school and uh, college, and okay. then Florida to Los Angeles for law school at Loyola Law. So uh, you, you graduated from law school at, at Loyola Law, and you're now an attorney. What are some ways that you represent some of the top restaurants and brands in LA? Yeah, so it, it's really interesting. Obviously, you start with the kind of pragmatic approach for restaurants. So you're dealing with company structuring, uh, investment vehicles, special purpose vehicles, investment memorandums, uh, operating agreements, partnership agreements, lease, lease negotiations, conditional use permits, alcohol, liquor licenses. What's been really interesting is kind of the evolution of the practice as we've moved in a, uh, you know, this the more digital world, really since COVID, since the pandemic, but we've moved into this digital world. So now we've been exploring and very, very involved in everything from, again, the metaverse and uh, Web3 components to the restaurants, to NFT use in the restaurants. Uh, to delivery, delivery models, digital delivery models. So there's, there's, there's been this, this very interesting evolution of the practice, hospitality practice, just over the past couple of years. But uh, fundamentally, it started like every other hospitality lawyer, restaurant lawyer, negotiating leases, negotiating partnership agreements, operating agreements, structuring the, the partnership of the restaurant, and uh, getting the restaurant open and ensuring that they continue to function in the face of you know, restaurants is a lot of adversity. So everything from employee employment, uh, employer wage and hour actions, class actions, slip and falls, uh, violations of liquor licenses, violations of health codes. There's, there's, I always tell people there's, there's an entirely a uh, large amount of moving parts in a restaurant, a, a disparate amount of moving parts as opposed to another business doing the same amount of revenue. So if you had a $3 million law firm, for example, you might be able to generate that with five lawyers and a couple of support staff, but a $3 million restaurant is going to be 30 individuals. And those 30 individuals are going to have 30 daily life problems. Their cat died, their grandma's sick, their roommate is moving out, whatever those those occurrences are. So there's, again, this disparate amount of, of problems for the same amount of gross revenue that you have to deal with as a restaurateur. Well, wow, all kinds of stuff. Do most restaurateurs, I guess, that, that you deal with, uh, are they aware, getting into it, that, that there's all these kinds of issues that they might have to, have to deal with? No. No, I would say absolutely not. Most restaurateurs have a, a fantasy uh, as of when they get into it about, you know, hosting dinners and, and popping bottles of champagne and, and pouring bottles of incredible wine and, and sharing laughs with their friends and family in a full restaurant, which, which as we know, and you know very well, is, is the, uh, the exception and not the general rule. Uh, so I think most people have a fantasy idea of what the, the practice looks like. And then there's, a, a unfortunately, a very different reality as to what the business looks like. So you, you, uh, as I mentioned in your intro, you'll be teaching a class this summer and you alluded to it earlier. Tell me about um, the web, uh, with web... Tell me about Web3 and the metaverse and kind of how you're, uh, you're exploring it and getting involved with that. 
Yeah. So the, the metaverse has been something Web3, you know, the, these terms are, are thrown around and, and I'm always a little hesitant to start defining them because I, I'd much rather say that the, the definition of them seems to elude everybody, including myself, and it seems to be constantly evolving, which I think is actually a good thing right now because it keeps everybody um, on their toes and everybody evolving with that. So the metaverse uh, you know, 1992, I believe, uh, Snow Crash is a, a novel that the, the first the first time that was termed. It's obviously seen quite quite an evolution itself since then, all the way up to you know the the latest Hollywood representation, which would be your Ready Player One, which I actually love. It's a great movie. I don't know if you've seen it, but if you haven't, watch it. Uh, these are, you know, different iterations or different ideas of what this metaverse is going to look like. And then there's there's a host of questions, uh, you know, decentralized and continuity amongst the platforms and and interoperability and use and hardware and software and compatibility. So there's there's all of these different considerations that we're all considering on a daily basis. But I think the easy way to think about it is this convergence of, of virtual reality, which we've all seen with the headsets. And this digital second life, this avatar life, um, and and I think that's kind of a, a an easy definition, or at least it was easy for for my kind of Neanderthalic mind at that point in time to say, what what is this? And uh, and that helped me. That helped me have an idea and a grasp and, and a vision of what it was, which helped me then say, what are the opportunities here, and and where could this market go? City just came out and said it's potentially a thirteen trillion dollar market opportunity by 2030. Um, now, they obviously qualified that based on, on phone, and mobile phone integration, and mobile phone compatibility, which is a big issue with the metaverse, uh, whether or not you'll be able to sit on your phone and what that experience will be like from an immersion Web3 perspective. But it, regardless of of where you sit in this argument or this conversation or this discourse, there is no arguing that the, the metaverse is is the future and it's going to be the future. And, and you need to be comprehensive of it, cognizant of it, uh, whether you're a, a restaurateur or a, a apparel designer or a uh, offshore casino, it, 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 irrelevant, but you need to be involved and have a, a thorough understanding or have someone in your payroll who has a thorough understanding. What goes into your role as LA City Small Business Commissioner? So it's, that's been an, an enormous honor, an incredible, incredible opportunity for me. I, I moved to Los Angeles uh, for law school with with nothing, mm-hmm. and uh, you know the city has been has been incredible. It's it's provided you know every opportunity for me. That the you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. I think is it couldn't there couldn't be a place where that statement is more true than Los Angeles. Um, it's a city of dreamers, it's a city where nothing is impossible. It's a city that if you have an idea and you want to work hard enough for it, and you refuse to say no. And as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger says, you break the rules, not the laws. Um, there, there's really nothing that can't be gained in this city or garnered or, or accomplished or achieved. So uh, being asked to be a small business commissioner was, again, this incredible honor because it let me meet with small businesses and and address concerns and, and um, consternations that these small businesses have and uh, engage in discourse with small businesses and help them try to avoid the pitfalls that certainly tripped myself and, and many of my associates and peers and other small business owners up. Uh, so it's been, <clears throat> it's been something that I've welcomed. It's been something that obviously during COVID became uh, much more involved and uh, a, a much bigger time commitment. And to be quite frank, much more stressful because you were fielding calls and concerns from individuals that were quite literally watching every penny, every asset, every investment that they had uh, dissolve before their eyes uh, and and trying to mitigate those concerns and, and assuage some of those fears was 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 impossible for all of us. But, uh, you know, we, we did it the best that we could as these, these commissioners and the city and the county and the state. Obviously, there was a lot of criticism of uh, how everything was handled, which I think, you know, some of it was probably fair and some of it was probably uh, correct. But again, I, I always say with COVID, the, the interesting thing about it was there's, there was quite simply no playbook. 
You know, if there's a, a natural disaster, we've got everything in place to address it. If there's an earthquake, we know exactly what we need to do. Now, based on the severity of it, the response obviously may be inadequate just because there's no way to plan or prepare for disasters of a certain level. But there is a playbook for how things would go. COVID was was simply uh, a disaster, and it was a disaster that there was no playbook. There was no Thomas Guide for it. There was nothing to sit and say, okay, this is how these, this should be undertaken. This is what the city should do. This is the county's role. This is the interrelation and the relation between the city and the county. This is where the state should come in. The federal government should mandate this, but they should leave this to the state. So what we saw was was really a, a very polarized country and and quite chaotic uh, discourse amongst everybody and uh, and total discord. So. Um, Again, the Small Business Commission has, has let me face a lot of these things, be involved in a lot of these things, understand, walk through what was, you know, I think will be considered in the future one of the most difficult times that the city and the, the county, the state, the country has faced and, and help as much as I, I possibly could, which I hope for some small businesses there was uh, some mitigation of, of harm on account of what myself and, and others did. What uh, I know you've been a board member for Mental Health America Los Angeles. Um, tell me a little bit about what you do for them and uh, why that's important to you. Absolutely. So Mental Health America Los Angeles is uh, one of the oldest and uh, most venerable mental health organizations in the world. It's, it's run by a group of individuals who are, are, are truly exemplary human beings. And it's something that, again, a, a huge honor for me to be a part of. Uh, I became very, very involved in mental health uh, from, from quite a young age uh, on account of or, or the concerns of mental health and the, um, the addressing of mental health and the destruction of the, the stigmas attached to mental health and, and the acceptance that this is something that we all struggle with. And uh, something that we all need to be extremely, extremely conscious of, uh, which we're not. We're we're all very, very good at physical health, and we're uh, and measuring it and, and quantifying it, and <clears throat> taking our body fat and our heart rate, going and taking our blood pressure at CBS. But we're very, uh, we are very inefficient at measuring our mental health and quantifying our mental health and understanding our mental health and taking the moments and the time out to to reflect on how you feel and you know, the, all the buzzwords that we've all heard hundreds of times, you know, are you okay? Asking yourself, are you okay? Taking a, uh, a moment out of your day, stopping and breathing, all of these things that sound very practical and, and in theory are very easy. We just are, we are not extremely efficient at effectuating them, which, which we definitely need to be better at. For myself, uh, unfortunately, I lost some very, very close family members at a young age and um, I've, uh, unfortunately, continue to lose uh, very, very close family members and very close friends and business partners to uh, to suicide. Um, and it's been something that, uh, you know, it's it's been a, a real struggle for me to face and to understand and to uh, uh, to really grasp and, and get my arms around and, and know and, and, and try to see the signs of people when they're struggling and try to be uh, sympathetic and empathetic and try to uh, put myself into a, a position of more understanding rather than, you know, this, this uh, kind of robotic and analytical approach to everything. Uh, I, you know, I think it, the, the pandemic, again, was something that, that was really not a catalyst for mental health and, and the, uh, you know, the, the deleterious of impacts and effects that social media is having on our on our mental health, uh, which I think is, is a room for a whole other conversation. But um, I think the, the pandemic was a real accelerant as in it, it forced us to look at this and say, this is, this is not a problem. This is, this is really an, an, an existential crisis. And I know that sounds, you know, like a, a you know, people could say that's a little hyperbolic. It's, you know, it's not really existentially um, threatening to the human race, but I think 
I think it is. I think because, you know, you, if you look at some of the things that are occurring today and the last week and year and last couple of years, you see things that unfortunately become almost commonplace now that we hear about it and we say, oh, that's horrific, that's terrible, and we move on with our lives. And, um, you know, some of these situations and scenarios are, are, are they're, they're not something that we should move on from. There's something that needs to be addressed. And uh, there's something that, that we need to find the causes and the root causes and the, the, uh, the reasons that we are mentally, globally in a place that is uh, fundamentally not healthy. Uh, it's, it's we're, we're not collectively in a good place, I believe. Um, and I believe there's <clears throat> so many contributing factors to this. Uh, and there's much, much smarter people than me are trying to figure out uh, and discern and distill what this all means and, and how to approach it, and how to solve it or, or address it or remedy it or mitigate the effects of it. I, I don't have an answer for any of it. I know that I can contribute with Mental Health America Los Angeles and some of the other um, uh, courses and practicums and uh, efforts that I'm involved with. There's one called uh, Giving Back Generation that I just did an interview with, and it was uh, with a lady named Raquel Stevens, who is an absolute saint, and it was an incredible opportunity for me to talk about it. Again, Mental Health America Los Angeles, just this this uh, organization that I am, I am not deserving to be on the board of, but I'm very appreciative of it. And it's something I'm passionate about. And I think something that we collectively as a, as a, as a human race, not, not as a country, but as a, uh, as a global community need to be really need to be cognizant of because it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite terrifying. I think the, the ramifications and repercussions of, of our continued misunderstanding of, of mental health. Yeah, thank you so much for your uh, your efforts with that and your service for that. It's cl- clearly something that uh, you know all of us need to be more um, aware of, more cognizant of. Along with all those things that you're involved with, you're also the owner and operator of a number of um, bars and restaurants, including a new membership-based whiskey bar at the Westin Bonaventure. Can you tell me a little bit more about that endeavor? Yeah, absolutely. That was uh, it's called the firm. The idea was to create a a McAllen centric. Uh, the McAllen centric bar, a bar that offered, you know, the, the greatest uh, offering of whiskey, Scotch whiskey in, in a really casual, but upscale environment uh, in a private membership setting, but not an exclusive private membership setting. Uh, I know that those sound somewhat contradictory, but it's really an inclusive uh, setting as in the private membership is we're open to everybody. We just want, you know, we want to uh, welcome people in. So we want people to come and, and, and participate and be a part of this club and tell us what kind of whiskey they like and tell us how they like it, what kind of music they like and really gather some information so we can make this, this private setting uh, really, really inclusive and, and, join the community together under this. We've got a, a second location, a sister location that we're looking at opening in the next couple of weeks in Santa Monica. And then this, this uh, again, this very, very loose private membership will garner you access to both locations. Um, so we're re- really excited about it. You know, Scotch whiskey business is, is an incredible business, something that I've been involved and interested in since I was a very small child. Um, and something that we're seeing incredible growth in over the last couple of years. And I think you're only going to see more growth in it as the demand grows and the rarity of it continues to uh, be enforced. And uh, obviously the production is, is limited. And once there's a 20-year-old whiskey, you can't necessarily make another 20-year-old whiskey until the next year And if you have a 19-year-old whiskey. So um, there's, there's a, a rarity and a, um, there's an inherent uh, limit, finite amount of, of this product, which I think makes it even more exciting and, and even more uh, exhilarating to be a part of it. So the firm is, is just that. It's... Uh, kind of gave it the name the firm is a little bit of a joke for our lawyer friends so they can say at nine o'clock at night i'm going to the firm and um and their significant other would say wow you really are 
are one of the hardest working ladies I've ever met or one of the hardest working gentlemen I've ever met. You know, go go to the firm and, you know, just dinner will be waiting for you or or we'll be waiting for you or thanks for working so hard. So it's kind of just a little a little fun and uh, and, and also something for the legal community. I really wanted to build something that, you know, uh, service the legal community uh, again to touch back on mental health uh, the legal community is is a very interesting community from my perspective it's you know, about 1.2 million plus strong in the united states i think it's a very underserved market when i say underserved i mean that the community <clears throat> is um, it is a very fractured community you know there's not there's not a lot of cooperation amongst the lawyers there's not a lot of thought and concern amongst lawyers for their fellow lawyers. And I think it's a very, um, it's a very unthanked profession. You know, if you do a very good job, if you're very efficient as a lawyer, the client says, well, of course you did a good job. You're my lawyer. I'm paying you $500 an hour. I'm paying you $900 an hour. I'm paying you 200, whatever, whatever that hourly happens to be. So there's not really any thanks for an efficient or a, a proficient job being done, but if the job is is mediocre, or, or or God forbid, the job is is less than perfect, or or even substandard, there's there's huge ramifications as a lawyer. So, and this is why you see these these quite quite scary statistics as to depression amongst lawyers and uh, suicide rates amongst lawyers, and also uh, a statistic that I would thought was very very interesting was the the um, depression level of entry L1 law students as opposed to graduating law students. And you see this, this quite terrifying and market incline as the student goes on to completing their, their law school education, which I think is, uh, which I think uh, really indicates that this changing evolving profession that used to guarantee uh, it not rich, riches or wealth necessarily, but certainly comfort. And I think it's complete uncertainty now. Uh, so this, this all kind of went into saying, let's, let's make a place where legal professionals can come. And obviously, again, everybody's welcome, but legal professionals can come and these ladies can, you know, come and have a place to have a, a lovely scotch or a glass of wine and talk about their day and talk about their work and talk about their family. And the gents can come in and talk about the sports, their family, their work, you know, whiskeys, whatever. Just again, a very, very inclusive place for, for legal professionals and their friends to gather and, and commune. Great, great. Very nice. Hey, uh, how is um, maybe a place like that or even the bar or nightlife industry kind of adapting and surviving in times where there seems to be a lot of change? I think it's it's interesting. It's dynamic. You know, we're all we're all moving and trying to remain as as malleable as as uh, as possible because we're you know even just last week uh, there was a, a news article or news drop that said that indoor mask mandates may return. So it, it's this it's this real uncertainty. And again, this goes back to something we, we spoke about 15 minutes ago. This just no no roadmap. You know, we're, so we're sitting saying, well, do masks work? Don't masks work? Does vaccination work? Uh, does it not work? And, and again, I don't want to even touch on the, the politics of this or, or, or where, I, where I happen to fall, because I, I believe that that's irrelevant for the purpose of the, the, this conversation. I, you know, purpose mm -hmm. of the, this conversation is we're just in this true time of uncertainty. And as much as everybody will say, well, this is a science, this is a science, or someone on the other side say, no, here's a science. And, and, and I think maybe 10 years from now or 20 years from now, we'll be able to look back on this and say, well, there was a science. And maybe it all falls somewhere in the middle, or maybe someone, you know, is, is proven unequivocally right impression. I, I don't really know, but but for right now, we're just dealing with with uncertainty. So you know, you're seeing it with clients. We're seeing it as we set restaurants up and people understand the value of patios now in outdoor space. And not to say that patios in outdoor space weren't coveted before or or seen as a valuable asset, but they weren't seen as a mandatory life giving asset. Now, if you don't have a patio or if the space doesn't have a patio, the majority of my clients would just move on to the next space. So you're seeing that really um, influence and mandate some of these leases, which is 
altering and impacting the landlords because now the landlords are being asked, well, there's no patio. I want to blow the front, the facade back 15 feet uh, and I want you to pay for it. The landlord's looking at, you know, myself and my tenants and my clients and saying, that's, you're asking me to incur a quarter million dollars of expenses so you can build a patio and open up a front facade in a building that's, that's aesthetically beautiful right now. And why am I doing this? And the client's saying, well, you're doing it because we need open air. We need a patio space. And who knows what's going to come back? And you know, two weeks ago, we were told that monkeypox is coming. So, so there's, you know, this, this restaurant is again, very, very difficult business. I mean, and I, I truly believe um, it, it's actually quite easy to quantify the, the varying levels of difficulty and why it's complex and why there's, again, so many moving parts, disparate amount of moving parts for the same amount of gross revenue to other businesses. So you're just seeing anxiety, you're seeing uncertainty, you're seeing people being very conscious of their leases. So they're asking for uh, force majeures to, to include uh, pandemics and endemics and uh, COVIDs and, and coronaviruses and, and all of these other outs, if you will, from leases and, and termination clauses and, and things called good guy clauses where the tenant's saying, look, I, I'll take the space, but I'm not signing a personal guarantee. I'll give you a good guy clause, which means when I, when I make the determination that I can't operate or function in this restaurant space, you're not going to have to kick me out. I'm not going to sit there and and uh, uh, freeload in the in the location and, and hang out and not pay rent. I'm going to broom sweep the the location, walk up, hand the keys to you, and walk out the door. So so we're seeing a lot of, of quite interesting um, evolutions of the 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 practice and the restaurant operations on account of uh, the, the the impact of COVID and the pandemic. You are the uh, you're the owner and the operator and and the creator of a, of a number of restaurants. Why is it important to you, with all you have going on, to remain so kind of close to the to the restaurant industry? Yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea what I'm doing half the time with that. So I, I think it's one of those things that once you're in the business, you 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 only get in the business, I believe. Or, or let me restate that you should only get in the business if you truly love the business because if you're getting in because you think you're going to make a, a, a fortune and you're going to be swimming in money and, and fame and fortune you're going to be horribly uh, it, it is it, it is not it's not what you see on tv it is not what you read about you know we hear all of these incredible success stories again those are those are very, very much the exception. Um, so for myself, I love the business. I love the idea of meeting people. I love the idea of hosting people. I love the idea of asking people to come to our restaurant, come to our brewery, come to our scotch bar. Uh, I think the camaraderie that can be built there, the community that can be built there is very, very hard to quantify from a dollar perspective of value in that. I think it's unquantifiable. I think being able to host a potential business person at your restaurant or or a restaurant that you're involved in is is extremely meaningful. It's the next best thing to have the person over to your house and cooking dinner for them and opening a bottle of wine and letting them meander around your house and look at your your personal photographs. I think the restaurant is is the next best thing. And actually, in some ways, I think it's even better because it lets the person come in and order the food that they want and order the wine that they want and have a night out that's not necessarily sitting in someone else's house and you know seeing people and being part of this experience and socializing. So. It's um, there's there's really again I believe an unquantifiable benefit to owning and operating, opening, and owning and operating restaurants. Um, at least for myself, there has been, and I think that's the lure. The lure is uh, you love walking. You know, I, I said a couple years ago, uh, one of the, the greatest sights I ever saw, and one of my favorite memories is I remember watching two people walk in a stout burger in Hollywood and I remember sitting down and I spoke with them and I said hey if you've been here before you know can I help you with the menu and they said we've never been here before we've just heard such great things about it and I said well wonderful if you have any questions let me know and they said well what would you suggest and I said well if there is nothing on the stout burger that that appalls you or, or um, you're scared of or, or you just specifically do not have a pension for uh, 
in order the stout burger it's our our namesake burger i think it's one of the best burgers that's ever been created and uh and, and i promise that you will like it as long as there's nothing on there that you are again uh, concerned about so I, they both ordered stout burgers, and I remember standing behind the bar and watching the individual take the first bite of it. And he took a bite, and it was his response that I'll never forget. He didn't say, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Well, and if he did, I couldn't see it because I was 40 feet away behind a bar. But it was just this look. He had this this look of, of pleasure and happiness, and he just nodded at his friend, and his friend nodded back. And then he took another bite and then he shook his head and put the burger down and just nodded. And it was just this, you know, 15 second interaction between two people with literally not a, a, a verbal word uttered, not a, a verbal, not a singular word uttered. And it just was everything. It was everything you needed to know to say that person just had an experience today on account of something that we've collectively created that is entirely memorable for them and entirely enjoyable. So things like that, little moments like that, that I look back and think, this is why we do it. Yeah. Wow. That's a great story. So that's at uh, Stout Burgers and Beers. You're a co-creator of, of that uh, that brand, six Southern California locations, I believe. How did, how did you kind of come up with that idea? What makes those burgers so great? And then I noticed on the website that they're cooked medium rare. Uh, tell me a little yeah. bit about, about all of those things. Yeah, that's that really was all uh, my partner and the chef, uh, Alex Kajanaris, a <clears throat> phenomenal chef who actually I went to law school with. And uh, he used to cook for everybody after uh, after hours and after going out. And I and, uh, was a self-taught chef and then went to Cordon Bleu and, and really mastered the craft and created this this menu that's really stood the taste uh, test of time. We're, you know, we're 12 years plus, which is a long time for a restaurant and, a, a, and an enormously... Uh, long time and almost an unheard of long time for a gourmet burger restaurant. Um, so I cannot take any credit for it at all. I had nothing to do with the creation of the menu except some of the names. I said, yeah, I like it or I don't like it. Um, he created it. And uh, the idea was to create a, a burger restaurant that took two very, very common things, burgers and beer. And kind of the thought process was the you know, the sum is greater than the, the parts argument that we would take these these two very commonplace products and we would combine them and curate them in such a way that these two mundane projects created a, this exceptionally gourmet experience for, for a very acceptable price point. That was kind of conceptually Stout Burger. And, uh, you know, it's done very well. We've had, we've had ups and downs. We've closed units. We've expanded and expansion didn't work. We've had units that we thought were going to be fantastic and weren't. We've had units that we didn't think were going to be incredibly profitable and fantastic that worked well. So it's been a great learning experience, a great brand. It's still here 12 years later. We're working on some kind of 2.0 and 3.0 iterations. We just opened our first uh, casual fast. Uh, Stout Burger at the USC campus, uh, University of Southern California campus outside of downtown Los Angeles. It's doing phenomenally well. It's very, very exciting to see, you know, a, a toned down version of this gourmet experience. Certainly still a very, very high quality burger and curated beer, but just not um, contemplating of an individual coming in with an hour to sit down and walk through this entire process, but more someone who's got 30 minutes, 35, 40 minutes, and still wants to really experience this, quote, better burger uh, paired with a beer, but doesn't have quite the same amount of time or is a little more price point sensitive. So we've got this fast casual version, which again, has been enormously successful so far. Uh, some great partners there and uh, we'll definitely be looking to do more of those this fast casual concept and um, you know just watching the market trends of plant plant-based uh, growth is uh, up until this year actually funnily enough read an article this morning on the treadmill that uh, the beyond companies and Oatly which were two enormously successful uh, front uh, you know forward thinking, moving plant-based companies and i think one was down 87 percent from its peak another 80 percent respectively um, so i think you're seeing a shakeout in the plant-based market which we, i think we all believe the new is inevitable 
But what I do also believe is that it is a future, and I don't mean it's a future that people will stop eating meat, but I think you'll continue to see attrition on the the meat eating population, or at least um, the the welcoming of plant based projects from individuals who were really opposed to it before. You know, you, you heard sometimes I remember sitting at restaurants and you would hear people and they were, you know, they were kind of it sounds funny, but they, they almost had this visceral opposition to, to plant-based products. And I'm certainly seeing that uh, diminished and I'm seeing uh, a real openness because I think the, the products, uh, plant-based foods, hemp products, for example, and some of these other just incredible, incredible plant-based products are coming out where people are looking at them saying, this tastes good. It's better for the environment. It's, um, it's obviously much healthier for me. And again, you know, I will qualify that statement by saying some of the products that are out, you could make an argument are not healthier, but I think there, there are some, there's some products now and over the past couple of years that have come out that are extremely conscious, not only of the environment, but of being uh, plant-based and also of being materially healthier for you than their, their, their animal uh, based uh, counterparts. So, you know, we're trying to be conscious of all of that. We've got three plant-based burgers on our menu right now, three actually plant-based patties. So an unlimited number of plant-based burgers. And um, so just some other things we're trying to really think through. We're working on a, a NFT drop that would allow for uh, memberships in the community. And uh, as Stout would be a part of that drop that would allow for this community experience a Stout prod product on a weekly basis as part of the benefits of being in this community. So again, just kind of looking at everything, looking at the markets, looking at where things are going, where the trends are going, uh, trying to be cognizant of minimum wage raises and uh, cost of goods increases and um, supply chain shortages. Again, just the a myriad of moving parts that, um, you know, we're, we are looking at just like everybody else saying we don't really know the answer to it, but we're, we're trying our hardest uh, to, to help not only ourselves, but our clients and our associates uh, navigate what is, is certainly uncertain waters, uh, un uncharted waters at this point. Sure. So you, you've got, you've got those, you've got stout burgers and beers, and then you've also got Boomtown Brewery and the Morrison. Can you tell me about those? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Morrison was named after my mom. It's a Scottish pub with an extensive whiskey and scotch collection again. Um, when we opened it, we opened it very, very scotch-centric. Uh, we had a, a quite a few dishes on there that were very, very Scottish. And uh, in fact, the whole menu was, was leaning uh, like British pub menu with, again, these, these very Scottish components. Uh, as we've uh, as we've kind of grown, we noticed that the market for that uh, was not as robust as we hoped. So we had to kind of evolve the menu, which you know goes back to maybe one of the minor themes of this this chat that I, I appreciate having with you uh, is we're you know we're constantly evolving and we're constantly trying to be as malleable as possible. And uh, you know we just saw that this this quote Scottish menu uh, was great for all my fellow Scots and, and all my Scottish friends, but it kind of missed the mark uh, for, for what was being considered pub food. So we had to evolve that into a, a much more pub-friendly, burger-centric, comfort food uh, location, but we have, and it's been extremely successful. Uh, I believe we're one of the top 10 rated Yelp restaurants in the state, and uh, you know expanded the patios and expanded into a second location and uh, it's just a fun concept it's a fun concept and it's it's done very very well and of course we've got the you know this massive lion rampant outside just in homage to uh scotland and, and uh, our community and uh, it's been fun it's been a great project and my mom loves to come and visit and see the the restaurant named after so that's been fantastic uh and Boomtown Brewery was is really a, a labor of love. Boomtown Brewery, we opened years and years and years ago in the Arts District, uh, really in a location that everybody kind of attempted to convince us was not a good play. But we 
we persisted and uh, actually walked through all of the entitlements and permits and licenses there on a, in a building that was not permitted as a brewery. So we really walked into what was a, a very complicated process willingly. Uh, in hindsight, you know, we may or may not have done that, but the end result, the, the benefits of it were were incredible to, to have that location uh, with those permits at the end of, again, what was, was a very laborious process, but we got there. And the brewery has enjoyed an immense amount of success and uh, expanded and continues to expand and is in, I think, over 600 retail locations now in the state of California. And the demand is is outpaced our ability to supply the product, which is always a wonderful product problem to have. And uh, it's, again, it's just a, a passion project. It's something that I, I really can't take much credit for. The, the team behind it is uh, my partners are, are incredible, incredible individuals. The brewer is amazing. The, the managing operator is, is amazing. Our, our managing operating partner is amazing. And uh, the community has been so supportive. So the Los Angeles community really embraced craft beer, which was interesting because craft beer was never necessarily associated with Los Angeles. Uh, but over probably the past three, four, five years, maybe even a little longer, uh, we've become quite a respected craft beer community and, uh, and, and part of that support and part of that innovation has uh, possibly come from us and uh, uh, maybe I'd like to think and uh, we've enjoyed the successes of it. So incredible product and, uh, you know, we, we do fun things. We do these uh, these art exhibit drops, and we do these these uh, artist serious cans where we pair up with local artists, and the local artists will come in and do murals at the brewery, and they'll design cans, and they're immensely, immensely successful and incredibly popular. Uh, and now we're doing something very fun with uh, NFT, a Goblin Town uh, NFT, uh, which is a new NFT, a relatively new NFT. Uh, project that's literally taken the NFT world by storm. So we're brewing uh, a couple goblin loggers right now, and we're utilizing the intellectual property uh, from the NFT as the label and the art. And we'll do these uh, goblin uh, hazy IPAs, which is which is fun and and somewhat novel. It was certainly not the first people to do it, but it's still kind of a fun novel space. So we're trying to to stay current and stay involved and and merge these uh, emerging technologies with old world craftsmanship, which is kind of the, the craft beer business. Very cool. Hey, I have one more question for you, but first, is there like a centralized uh, maybe website that people can go to and find out about all the things you're involved with, your restaurants and uh, your other things? Yeah, just charleslew.com is probably the easiest. C-H-A-R-L-E-S-L-E-W.com, charleslew.com. Great. Hey, uh, last question for you. You know, you're, you're very busy. You're an attorney. You've got all these restaurants. You're involved as the LA City Small Business Commissioner. Uh, you're You're an advocate for mental health. What are some daily rituals that you find most important like what's what's kind of a typical day for you uh the gym the gym is very important i try to i try to get into the gym every morning around 6 or 6 30 it happens about 80 percent of the time uh it's just something i've done my whole life and it really allows me to uh kind of function and and you know, 30, 45 minutes of quiet time that I'm not bombarded with emails or texts or calls or questions or comments or concerns. Uh, so that's something that I've been incredibly, incredibly involved with. Um, uh, just, it's always been a part of my life and it's, it's been a huge benefit. So something I recommend to all of my friends and uh, all the young lawyers that I speak with is just, just get into some kind of ex- or exercise regimen, whatever that happens to be, and stick with it. It's just create a habit and stick with it. It'll, it'll really behoove you and it will continue to benefit you, I, I believe, for your whole life. Um, yeah, I, I try to read a lot. I used to be like really just an avid reader. I've, I've not as much time now as I used to, to, uh, to sit down with uh, the material book. So I do a lot of audibles uh, and uh, very, very, very interested in those because I spend so much time driving. So it's always good to have that hour, hour and a half, two hours to sit and read or listen to the book being read to me. Uh, mm-hmm. 
I, uh, you know, I, I am very active in the community and, you know, I encourage that. So whether it's the city of Los Angeles or, you know, my, my local neighborhood, try to stay active in quite a few different philanthropic endeavors. So we have an adoption charity that I'm very involved with and we have a few um, homeless skid row charities where we uh, get together cumulatively uh, as a group, uh, project paper bag, adopt together, sit to give and, and try to do some things and, and try to work on giving back. I think it's, it's very important. And uh, a lot of times people say, I don't have time for charity. I'm too busy with work. And, and I certainly understand that sentiment. And I think, you know, there's, there's an argument you could make to say that I'm just too busy. I, one of the things I always tell people is some of the most valuable relationships I've ever had or built or developed uh, specifically of a pecuniary nature, of a financial nature, where uh, the provenance of them, the origin of them was uh, at a charitable event or at a philanthropic event or in the course of completing some kind of philanthropic activity. So I think it's, uh, I think it's one of those things where, you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, say that, you know, that karma or, or one of these situations, but I think anytime you put like-minded individuals in a place with the idea that they're going to do something altruistic, there, there's a very good chance that, that lots of things can spawn from that. So I've always tried to, to remain very active in, in philanthropic endeavors. So, you know, and just, just entrepreneurs and, and mentoring, I always said, you know, people say, what, you know, what do you wish you could have had earlier? Or what would have helped you? Or, you know, what, is, what, what did you not have? And I always think I didn't really ever have a mentor, uh, which, you know, I think it worked out fine. But I always think that it, it, I could have advanced or, or progressed much, much faster had there been someone looking at what I was doing and saying, good idea, bad idea. I don't know. I, I don't have any concept. Try it. Um, for me, it was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of falling down. It was a lot of, you know, the old Rocky saying, it's not how hard you hit, it's how hard you can get hit, keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward. So for me, it was kind of trial and error, get punched in the mouth and get back up. And I don't think that's the best way to do anything. I think it, it creates probably for a good podcast interview or a good story, but, but not, not efficient at all. So I think mentoring uh, people is, is very important and not just young people. You know, I have clients and friends who are enormously successful in, in businesses that they've had for a long time. And now they want to expand into other businesses. And, you know, some of these individuals, ladies and gentlemen, are 60, 65, 70 years old. So, you know, I don't think mentoring um, has to be someone necessarily younger than you, your mentee. I think it could be. Uh, just an individual that is is following a path that you may have trod before, and some of your life experiences may be uh, valuable to them, and, and again help them avoid some of these pitfalls that trip up uh, small business owners and entrepreneurs and empresarios as they engage or undertake or endeavor to to start these businesses. So, those are a couple of things that I think would be very valuable for anybody. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, Charles, it's been great to talk to you. I really appreciate your time and your thoughts and your insights. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. I really appreciate your time. Have a great day, Chad. You too. Thank you. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.